Hello. In the traditional motion picture story, the villains are usually defeated. The ending is a happy one. I can make no such promise for the picture you're about to watch. The story isn't over. You and the audience are part of the conflict. How we meet the communist challenge depends on you. What has happened so far, what is happening now is far from encouraging. And where do you think this is? It's communist-inspired rioting in San Francisco, USA. Look at those faces. The face of communism in America. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Herbert Philbrick. As I travel around, I still have people say, well, why are you so hard on communists? They're just another political party like any other, and a poor minority at that, and so misunderstood. Well, we don't want them misunderstood, and that's why we're making this film. And that's why I say they are lying, dirty, shrewd, godless, murderous, determined, and it is not an American political party like any other. It's an outlaw organization taking its orders and instructions from another government to do everything possible to destroy our government. It's an international criminal conspiracy. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. No man risks his life the way I have. Oh, listen, I'm sick of that. Many millions of men risk their life, and they could come before this committee and answer the question whether or not they were a member of the Communist Party. And let me remind you that Benedict Arnold was also a member of the armed forces of the United States. You're implying... Well, with the question. You're implying I'm a traitor. No. You heard what I, I said. I am no I'm Benedict Arnold. Come it is a mighty shame that a man like me has to be brought here and crucified in the press and everything. Well, your stealers are bred from children. I have three kids. Mr. Wetterlich, that's what you are. Will you answer the question, please? I did. I know about my own country. Hi. Remember me? I'm the person who's doing the film. Well, I was calling back to see if you decided yet whether you'd be willing to do an interview with us for the film. Uh-huh. You feel... Yeah, yeah. But look, you've been a tenants leader for what, 15 years now? Okay, more than 15 years. And the people know your work and they trust you. Do you really feel as though as if they found out now that you had been a communist, that they'd, they'd somehow decide you aren't a good person now? Yeah, yeah I, I know it's a, I realize it's a risk. Uh-huh. Okay, well, that's, that's your decision. <laughs> It was a decision I had to make. A lot of work I do is either federally or state funded. So, you know, they might say, well, we can't have a known communist. But then I said, if I die, why shouldn't there be a record? How could I have been so good when I was active and be so bad because I tell them I'm a communist? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I felt that I uh, owe it to everybody uh, who knows me to know who I was and who I am and why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's not easy on friends and family, but I really believe it's better to put your cards on the table. How did you feel sort of proclaiming to the world that you are part of the communist Well, movement? while you were gone, Ben and I talked about that. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, we that? did. We feel like a lot of people are going to be surprised if they find out. And I feel those who know us and like us, it'll be real good that they find out mm -hmm. if they don't know. How about those people who might feel negative? Well, tough shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how I feel about it.
communism, the great American taboo. Yet between the 1930s and the 1950s, almost a million Americans passed through the Communist Party of the United States. You'll meet some of them in this film. We've chosen to look at the backbone of the party, the men and women of the rank and file who were members for many years. This generation came of age in the Depression. They made a decision to be radicals, to challenge the very fabric of their society. How that decision affected the rest of their lives is the thread of our story. And it's by no means a simple story to tell. For many people, this was the first time they have spoken openly about their lives in the American Communist Party. The party headquarters over on 13th Street in an old loft building, that's where it was. And on the fifth floor was the New York District, and on the ninth floor was the Central Committee. I'll never forget it, see? So I went to the fifth floor. <laughs> I went down, you know, I went down to see the district leader, see? And did you sign up? I was in a party. You signed up just he like that? signed just like that. Was that a big decision to no, make? No, no, wasn't any decision at all in those days. I'm gonna let me tell you the truth. It was just what, with my background, you had to do. Nobody else was doing anything. The image that I grew up with of the party was that it's this subversive organization of people in trench coats and people spying, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know. Oh, really? And it's a heavy thing to be a communist. And to say I was a communist is a, that's a fairly strong thing. So that's why I say when you joined, weren't you scared? Weren't you? No. I didn't see anybody around with trench coats and things. <laughs> But you know what I, I mean, right? Yeah, I know, sure, I know what you mean. No. See, that's no, what no, I grew no. up with, is what comes. No, 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 no. Not then it wasn't. They weren't, you know, having mass recruiting of joining a communist party. You had to prove that you were a worthy individual that they could trust. And I thought I was doing good work. I mean, I was the leader of our youth, you know, organization. And, uh, but they concentrated on my brother. They weren't recruiting any woman. So they, they took my... Women. There was one woman, she was the section organizer's wife. So they would take him to communist conventions and they would give him literature, but he wasn't that interested. So finally, they decided they needed someone to take the minutes of their meetings and collect the dues, so they approached me. And I was very thrilled that I had the honor of joining the Communist Party. Didn't it make you worry that the communists were talking about overthrowing the government? Didn't worry me a bit didn't worry me because I was suffering from the discrimination and, and, and the, the humiliation of discrimination, you know? I'm coming up from the South, and I, and I think, you know, at last, freedom. And I walk into a restaurant, and they say, we don't serve niggas. You know, a lot of people say, when people are radical, go back where you came from. Well, if I was sent back where I came from, it would be across the street from Kruger's Brewery on Hill Street in Orange, New Jersey, January 30th, 1915. That's where I was born. Uh, and some people say I brag about being a street nigger, but our family was in the gutter. You know, the street was something we wanted to climb up to. We would, we would have loved to get up on the curb. <laughs> This was in the middle of the Depression, 1932, 33, 34. 70% uh, of the black males in Harlem were unemployed. In order for the family to survive, both my sister and I had to work. And the best work we could find was dancing at the Cotton Club in Harlem. It was designed like a plantation. It was an all-black show, all-black waiters, but all-white guests. And they really wanted to be slave masters. They were there to be entertained by us hip-wriggling blacks with all of our exotic and sensual capacities laid bare for them. I couldn't uh, swallow that. I said, what, what's in this country that here we are scuffling and buck dancing for $35 a week, and people can come from downtown in tuxedos and 
evening clothes, white tie and stiff collar and diamonds and everything, and spend $1,000 for a night's entertainment. So uh, I saw in life itself what uh, class distinctions meant. And the more communists I met, the more I liked what they had to say and what they were doing. Because I, I saw that uh, of all the people who were talking about solving problems and programs and so forth, when there was a picket line, they were out front. I don't care if it was on 14th Street, 42nd Street, 34th Street, every community. There was some guy up in that soapbox going away, you know, the working class, the capitalist class has nothing in common, nothing. You know, and you'd ponder that. And then it went on and on and on about how they exploited you. And you'd have to sit there, you thought about it, you'd say, Jesus, that's so right. Them son of a bitch is up there eating the filet mignon, and we're down here eating burnt liver. People are queer, they're always crowing, scrambling and rushing about. Why don't they stop someday? Address themselves this way. Why are we here? Where are we going? It's time that we found out. We're not here to stay. We're on a short holiday. Life is just a bowl of cherries. Don't take it serious. It's too mysterious. But this country is coming to. I sure would like to know if they don't do something by and by. The rich will live and the poor will die. Doggone, I mean the panic is on. There wasn't a day went by that there wasn't some communist in some particular neighborhood leading a delegation of 25 people down to the welfare board or some other board. These people are hungry, feed them and give them something to eat, give them rent or do something. There was this type of activity going on. Now, when you take a group of people, 25, 30 people, who don't know from nothing, don't know rheumatism from communism or what the hell, they just don't know nothing, and you take them down, lead them down to, say, a welfare director where the guy jumps up on the desk, I mean, he's running, he's berserk. This is what was happening in them days. And the people come out, you come out victorious where you do get a check, you do get a box of food, the gas, they turn it on, or whatever it is. I mean, you're gonna give much credence to the type of person that's doing this for you. You must say, Jesus Christ, uh, contrary to what I heard about the communists or the red, the man can't be bad or the woman can't be bad. Look what they've done for me. <laughs> Starts off peaceably enough down there in front of the mayor's office, but before long, things begin to get hot. About a thousand of the Reds defy the police orders to move, and so the orders are being carried out. And a lot of the Reds are carried out, too. And the cops are having a busy time of it, but it won't last long, and another Red rally bites the dust. be in a demonstration and I see mounted police charge into people. And you see horses' hoofs stomping on people. People being clubbed. Why? Because they were demonstrating for, for bread, a job. And to me, that was it. That, that was the movement, helping people to uh, fight to change oppressive conditions. We went into situations where, in retrospect, I'd be scared to death. You know, they were beaten heads mm -hmm. openly. There, were, there was bloodshed on the, on the ground. And there wasn't even a question of not going. You know, you knew you were going to go. I mean, the stakes were high. And the exhilaration was just total, total. And it was very easy to make this an absolute life's commitment at that moment. Every uh, Friday morning was going out to some aircraft factory and passing out leaflets. And then twice a week, because at the time I was still at, uh, going to college, passing uh, out leaflets at the gate of, if it was up here, it was at Sather Gate, and now at UCLA it was someplace else. Um, 
really persistently doing work that I uh, didn't find terribly <laughs> exciting. Oh, I didn't really enjoy doing, but did it because I knew it was yeah, important. Yeah, it yeah, was exactly. absolutely you important know, was to like do. And I really? could make myself do it because mm -hmm. it was important. Did you yeah, ever have to talk? I didn't talk, but participated in a street corner. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. My <laughs> husband was given the job in the avenues, would you believe, Richmond, with all these kind of fat middle class ladies scurrying around on a Saturday doing their marketing and shopping. And he would stand up on a soapbox and say, Friends! <laughs> and I would die. Well, first of all, it's, uh, if, you're not been, if you've never been on a soapbox, it's sort of awkward. You get up on a chair and a little, and you look out, especially when the guy will precede you by saying, and the next speaker is Bill Bailey, a member of the Marine Workers and Industrial Union, a great and this and that and all. You know, to give you a big razzle-dazzle, and you get up there and you look out over a couple of hundred faces, nobody's laughing, no expression, you know, no nothing. You don't know if they got a ham sandwich in their hand, they got to hit you with or what. And you're supposed to razzle-dazzle them, you know, stir at them, you know, really get them up to where they're screaming bloody murder. Well, you know, <laughs> and you get up there and your mouth is dry, you know, butterflies in your stomach. I mean, you're complete emotional, ready to collapse. And the first thing you said to yourself, I wish an earthquake takes place at this very minute, you know. <laughs> but anyway, like everything else, you take a deep breath and you say your first word. And the second one comes out a little bit easier. And after you get the word fellow worker, you know, uh, out of your mouth. That's the way it is. Then, bit by bit, you start warming up. I'm glad you've asked me my story. I have a story to tell. How rising in union and giving my heart brought great joy. That is fair is the vision we hold in honor and peace where we all share the load where struggling for change is a natural thing to keep to our promise to bring through our dreams I'm glad you asked me All the various uh, party units throughout the country would pick out the best potential leaders. You know, they had them from the uh, marine workers, you know, from the waterfront. They had longshoremen, they had teamsters, they had textile, they had rubber. In other words, they would pick out the best potential person or, 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 or male or female who could be developed into a good leader by going to school. There were about 60 students, and uh, about six of us were picked out as had to have special tutelage. Because, first of all, we came from the mills, they came from the mines, and just to sit in a classroom for five, six hours, we couldn't absorb anything, and I, we would, I would fall asleep. 
in my position at that time to find out that I was picked out you know, to go to National Training School, there was enormous responsibility given to me that I got to learn. I mean, God damn it, Stanley, you get in there, and then no matter how high it is, stay there and read, and oh, oh, oh. Well, the tutor that was my tutor fell in love with me, I guess working closely with me or something, and convinced me to marry him, but really convinced me. And some of the other students also helped to convince me. What do you mean he convinced you? That I should get married, and the two of us would make a marvelous team, and why should I go back to the mill? Which after a while, I didn't think it was a bad idea. Why should I go? After all, I got six months training. I will now be a professional revolutionist. Well, why should I go back to the mill? So I figured, and besides, he was good looking and he was a good dancer. So that helped, you know. So I figured, fine, <laughs> I agreed. So right at the end of school, Ohio State Convention of the Communist Party was being held. So both of us went there and I asked what our assignments would be, since we're both trained right? Revolutionists. So they didn't know where to put us, so they suggested I go back to the mill and my husband become the section organizer and I support him. And that was the end of that. I says, I will do nothing like that. When I finished that six-week school, uh, I came out uh, marching and I was ready to go back to Harlem and start the revolution by myself. <laughs> we didn't have any identity crisis. I, I... We didn't have any worries about what was our role, what was our destiny, what individual fulfillment we were seeking for. We knew with absolute conviction that we were part of a vanguard that was destined to lead an American working class to a socialist revolution. There was just simply no question at all in your mind that who you were and what you were and why you were, what was the meaning of life, you had that answer. Dorothy joined the party when she was 14. Like many communists, she worked as a union organizer in the 1930s. Her main work was among farm laborers, whose wages and conditions were some of the worst in the country. Salinas Valley, two cent cotton. I'm on picket, Lord, I'll try. God, I'm tired of picking cotton. In May of 1937, she was called in to help by striking cotton pickers in Southern California. I stayed in the home of one of the uh, field workers, and I would sleep in the iron bedstead with the four children. It was a constant struggle for the barest kind of existence of living. The first thing that was done was to call a mass meeting of all participants husbands, wives, children, they had to learn to run that strike. They had to have the power that they could do something about their own lives if they were organized together. I would suggest that the people there describe what they considered the important issues. It would be people talking from their guts. As I looked out at that audience, there was a kind of joy. Here were people in the most desperate living conditions who had discovered what unity meant, what solidarity meant. The communication back and forth, you were one. The speaker, the strikers, there was no we and they. There was only us. I don't remember not one person ever feeling it was a sacrifice. It, we, I want to emphasize, we got more enrichment, we learned more, we acquired more ourselves than any other comparable experience could ever have given us. A lot of your questions have led me back and through the years to what I might call my radical youth and life as a young man. And that's good. I, I sometimes think about that period. But I would not want to give anybody the impression that those were my golden years or the best years of my life or anything like that. I see it as something that I passed through in the same way that I passed through my adolescence or my childhood. In the 1930s, Carl worked as a reporter for the Midwest Daily Record. 
a communist-sponsored newspaper published in Chicago. One of the stories that I covered was a strike of sharecroppers in what was called Swamp East Missouri, the area around Sykeston, Missouri. These sharecroppers had simply moved out on the highway to demonstrate their problems. They moved out. They moved all their belongings right out on the highway. Their idea was that in this way, the cars passing would somehow deliver their message to Washington or to wherever. You say that it was a dramatic story. You had described this to us before, so I got some clippings. I want to just read a little bit of it because I thought it All was right. really quite something. It says, Sykeston, Missouri, January 13th. Uh, sharecroppers send out a plea to smash through the terror ring of the planters with food and supplies to keep them alive. Today, these Negro and white victims counted the near dead, the sick, and the hungry. Huddled in flimsy, improvised shelters, evicted tenant farmers and their wives and kids face starvation today. On roadside fires, sizzled the last few strips of bacon and the last handful of beans. Well, it, it certainly was very dramatic for me, and, uh, and I wrote it without trying to be melodramatic, but it certainly, the, 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 the conditions that I saw there were such that I, I couldn't write it any other way. Every night, Carl wrote letters to his wife about the sharecropper's story. At the time he read them to us, he hadn't seen them in many years. All day long, I hear the talk of planters and their stooges, deputies, state troopers, bureaucratic small-time officials. And when they say nigger and nigger lover and lynch and agitator and communist, they mean violence. And all of it is directed against a few hundred mild and wonderful people, simple, quiet, intelligent, honest, loving people who are starving in a swamp. It's all too damned ominous, like something horrible were about to happen. I've been feeling this way all day. This morning, I went out to a dismal bog where the sharecroppers are. It rained continuously, and I sat in one of those excuses for a tent and talked and talked and helped to move the pans around to where the water was dripping in worst. Something sings inside of me when I'm with these people, and it runs, Arise, ye wretched of the earth. I heard stories today that would make your blood freeze, and through it all ran the same. The same savage depravity about a planter who whipped a sharecropper's hog to death because it was on his land about a sharecropper who was tied to a post and flogged to death, about a little Negro boy who was starving and stole some beans and was beaten and forced to work in the field for a week to pay, pay the damage. By intervals, this thing has ripped the heart out of me and inspired me as few things ever have. It's the colossal guts of these people. Bucking a setup as cruel and hidebound, as ruthless and powerful as the planter autocracy. It's a story that I'll tell you for weeks if I ever get back. I don't want your millions, mister. I don't want your diamond ring. All I want, just the right to live, mister. Give me back my job again. I know you have the land deed, mister. The money is all in your name. But where's the work that you did, mister? I'm demanding back my job again. So I don't want your millions, mister. Your diamond ring All I want Just the right to live, mister Give me back my job again Think me dumb if you wish, mister Call me green or blue or red 
communists had an impact on the shape of their era. Many reforms we take for granted today were first brought to public attention by the Communist Party and the thousands of men and women who worked with them. They organized councils of the unemployed that effectively pushed for social security and unemployment insurance. The party fought against the racial segregation and discrimination that were the accepted practices of the day. Many racist landlords and businessmen faced their picket lines, boycotts, and sit-ins. In the South, communists protested lynchings and worked for voting rights for black citizens. We're gonna roll, we're gonna roll, we're gonna roll the union on. We're gonna roll. Perhaps the communists' greatest impact was on the labor movement. In the 1930s, America's major industries were being organized for the first time, and communists played a key role. From auto to steel, from maritime to mining, they were among the most skillful and dedicated organizers. And in many of the new CIO unions, they rose to positions of leadership. But some things about the communists cut against the American grain and raised deep suspicions. Your movement was constantly accused of not really being concerned with American people's interests, but rather with promoting the Soviet Union. And we've seen demonstrations with communists carrying signs of Lenin, Stalin, defend the Soviet Union. So why would you do that? I think it was because the Russian Revolution had an incredibly um, electric effect on all the left-wingers in this country in 1917 in a way that's very hard for anybody to understand now. But there had been a large socialist movement in this country, and it had a, there was, it, but socialism was a dream. It had never happened. Generations of communists had developed who believed that the Soviet Union was not only the expression of the first conquest, the first victory of the working class in showing that, that you could build a society without bosses, but that it was the example of all that was best and purest and most desirable. <laughs> Everybody knew somebody that went to the Soviet Union to visit. The Soviet Union had a big tourist campaign, and there were thousands and thousands of people that went to the Soviet Union, mostly teachers. They could afford it. <laughs> you hear about no racial discrimination. You hear about no unemployment. You hear about, you know, a kind of egalitarian society that is just very unlike anything we have here, you know. I mean, in, in the 30s, people were extremely conscious of the huge disparity between the poor and the rich, between poverty and its plenty. We were extremely loyal to the Soviet Union, but that didn't seem like any contradiction to us of being loyal Americans. I mean, yeah, you were... That didn't make you un-American? It didn't make us feel in the slightest degree un-American. We, we felt that we were, we were interested in the best... We were concerned about the best interests of the American people. To us, that meant the best interests of ordinary people. We, were, we, were, we considered ourselves very much small-D Democrats. We really believed in the American dream. You'd be listening to a conversation of six or seven people chewing a rag, and you'd always hear somebody saying, but they've done it in Russia. There's no unemployment in Russia. Everybody's working in Russia. If it could happen in Russia, why can't it happen here? Mm -hmm. And these were just simple Americans. American communists were not only inspired by the Soviet Union, their party accepted leadership from it. The very structure of the party was modeled after the Soviet experiment. Lenin had said, a party of a new type was needed to overturn the capitalist class. It had to be somewhat like an army with a clear chain of command. Once a decision was reached, no dissension was allowed. It was accepted by American communists that many decisions came from the top down and had to be carried out. And, like the Bolsheviks in the repressive days of the Tsar, many communists kept their membership secret. Our neighbors, let's say the people we were closest to, did not know us to be party members. In many cases, our shopmates or people we worked with did not know us to be party well, members. Suppose if your neighbor did know, do you think they would, would have rejected you? I think the, the, uh, the, the, the party view was that, uh, that uh, you don't have to go around announcing yourself as a party person. 
uh, that's unnecessary. You just do your work. You know, if you'd say, look, I'm a communist and go around wearing a button, you know, that you're a communist or wear, uh, we say wear it on your sleeve, the workers aren't brought up to that point where they understand it. But if you tell them, don't be afraid of the word communism because you will be called a communist. Hmm. If you argue with your grocer on the price of bread, they'll say, what are you, a communist? You don't like it here? Well, you but, know, no, but then later on when someone tells them you are a communist, it turns out they find out, then they think that, well, you, you no, lied no, to them. No, 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 it isn't that. They disrespect me for what I am, you know? But wouldn't they think that you were being, you were being dishonest? How could they find out that I'm a communist? Suppose someone comes along and tells them that you are. So it's a, their word against mine. They never came to approach me and ask me. In many ways, you do have a secret life. You, you, uh... Certainly your work life, unless you happen to be working for a left organization, your work life on the whole, people do not know about your politics. A, we would be fired and we couldn't, you know, make a living. And, but I think that something else that we felt was that people couldn't be effective politically if their politics were open. Uh, they couldn't get elected to union office. They couldn't, um, you know, they couldn't, or not just union office, any kind of organizations they were working with, they wouldn't be trusted because there was so much anti-communist feeling in the country. And um, in my view, that was a great mistake in retrospect. Um, but at the time, you simply felt it was necessary. And... Uh, um, and, and you were, in fact, upfront about your politics to as large a group of people as you felt safe to be so. I remember the Madison Square Garden meetings. There were 20,000 plus people in one room, you know, all chanting the same slogan, enormous spirit. things like this that kept you feeling you weren't totally alone you were part of something big and that made you feel worthwhile because mm -hmm. you knew that your own minuscule efforts were not going to do any huge thing for the mm -hmm. revolution but combined with 20,000 other people you felt that you really mm -hmm. were going to mm -hmm. make a difference in the world events and issues are beginning to stand out so that they can be seen by the masses you don't have to give long-winded explanations anymore People see, the people understand. What they need is a voice to express it for them and an organization to rally them. And the people are going to march forward with the people who will belong the victory. You got the feeling there's such a groundswell. Oh, Christ, in the next couple of years, in fact, I sheepishly, I, I, I feel embarrassed, an old... Jewish guy asked me, he had so much confidence in me, he said, Bill, when do you think the revolution is going to come? And I said, the way I feel, I said, I'm sure it's going to come within five years. He said, thanks, I, I hope I shall live to see that day, I, I shall hold myself together. You felt you could change the world, right? And you worked hard for that. But some people would say you communists were super dedicated, you know, nose to the grindstone, no fun at all, work, work, work. That's a lot of bullshit. <laughs> well, but, They're talking about some party members. But not, you weren't like that? No. No. I always took time out to relax. And some of my party comrades felt I relaxed a little bit too much. <laughs> for a party leader. You mean it was sort of a problem? Yeah, that was a problem for them. <laughs> it was never a problem for me. Because I knew when to have a good time. And I knew, I knew where the good times were, and, and I included them in my itinerary. Even though I worked 18 hours a day, I always believed that all work and no play not only made Jack a dull boy, <laughs> but it made him grim. <laughs> <laughs> and I did not want to be grim. Even if you were a communist. Right. Particularly because I was telling people, you know, join the party and really live. Get a deeper comprehension of life. And life should be joyous. 
you think you had a counterculture, I, I always am amused. We had a counterculture from the 30s and the 40s that I would suggest was far more all-powerful, all-inclusive than anything than the generation of the 60s the young left thought they had created. There were picnics, there were dances, there were parties. There was an enormous amount of singing. One could really live one's whole life totally within that culture. There was no dividing line between the personal and the political, between the private and the, and the social. It was all intertwined and, and, and intermingled. All your loves were part of it, too, your friends and your relationships and, um, and, and the kids growing up together. I mean, you had a, you know, kind of a whole total world well, that was really was, was very rich in many ways. I tell you, I could cry thinking of the excitement and the pride and the feeling we went, we had. We just marched through the streets with pride and feeling that we are the people that count. May Day was such a holiday. I remember when our children were little, we used to carry them on our shoulders. There was something that we were so excited about. It meant so much to us. You just felt that day you own New York City. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people. The John Reed Clubs would have poets out, reciting poetry. The John Reed Club, the artist section of the John Reed Club, did all of these banners for, for different organizations. Tremendous, tremendous, tremendous things. Socialism wasn't the only political movement to grow during the Depression. In Italy and Germany, fascist parties came to power with claims of solving the deepening economic crisis. Communists around the world made the defeat of fascism their top priority. The first battle against fascism began not with World War II, but in Spain. In 1936, the Spanish military revolted against the democratically elected left-wing government. Civil war broke out. While the Western democracies took no action, Hitler and Mussolini came in on the side of Franco, supplying massive arms and aid. Hitler was getting powerful. Uh, there were Jewish uh, programs being committed. And there was nothing in my soul that was more devastating than to see the Nazis laughing, bastards laughing, while they dragged some poor Jewish woman naked across the street through spit and manure and everything else and threw her on a sidewalk by the back of the neck, right Jew all over the windows, you know, all this type of stuff. I mean, because I saw that was my family that they were doing it to. You know, if they could do it to Jews, they could do it to my mother. And that son of a bitch, no son of a bitch was going to do it. And we, something had to be done, you know. And I said, I, I don't care how, I've just got to get to Spain. When you're a communist and you're an organizer and you're in the streets, there's always a cop, there's always the detective, and the, there's always the official violence, which you, you're not allowed to answer as a communist. You can't strike back. But you knew that if you went to Spain, that if you were a soldier and if you had a gun, and I knew about guns, then that would be different. You would be legal, and you'd do right. 3,200 Americans went to fight for Spain, along with 40,000 men and women from around the world. These international brigades were organized primarily by the communist movement 
in an attempt to counter Franco's military superiority. The Franco forces were getting more and more equipment and sophisticated equipment in the way of planes, tanks, artillery from Italy and from Germany. And I remember when, after I was wounded, there were a few of us were crossing an open field and nine planes drafted just a handful of men. Now, what are they going to afford to waste ammunition like that? You know, even an idea of the ridiculousness of the odds. We had three guns for almost 300 men. I know it seems incredible, but that's true. Mm -hmm. Must have made it hard to fight the war. Well, they didn't. They died. Hundreds of them. That night. In one night. Harama was on hills. And the idea was there was to be an artillery barrage. And then the kids went over. And I forget how many hundreds died and how many hundreds were wounded. And then those of us who were, had not gone over had to go out and get them and bring them in and bring them around to ambulances that had to be summoned quickly. Well, during the night, Julie, handling sick, demoralized people, I didn't think about it at all. Just trying to get them back out of harm's way. I didn't like the idea of getting hit and wounded and banged up. Who, who wants it anyway? But uh, if I had to do it again, I would have done it anyway, because I think it was a good cause. And, uh, and if you believe in something, you do it. You know, theory is one thing, but practice is, I think, is more important at certain times and certain places. The Republicans were badly outgunned and outsupplied. They appealed again and again for help, but no aid came. In the spring of 1939, Spain fell to Franco. Within months, over 150,000 people were executed. It was the crux of everything that we were involved in, everything we were doing. It was all being fought out. And I think we saw very clearly that it was sort of the prelude to probably a, a much bigger war, which indeed it was. England, France, and the U.S. had stood by while Hitler advanced in Europe. The Soviet Union repeatedly called for a mutual defense pact to stop fascism's spread, but the West refused. In 1939, the Soviets suddenly changed direction and signed a non-aggression pact with Germany. The American party accordingly changed its line. Many felt betrayed by this abrupt policy change, and numerous supporters and members fell away from the party. By 1941, Hitler invaded Russia, the United States was attacked, and World War II was in full swing. The U.S. and Russia found themselves allied. Joseph Stalin was declared Man of the Year by Time magazine. But the joyful meeting of Russian and American GIs that signaled the end of the Nazis also signaled the beginning of a new era. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Nineteen forty seven opens a new political era in America. A Republican majority Congress for the first time in fourteen years. 
Of international significance are the first words of the new House Speaker sounding the year's keynote. There is no room in the government of the United States for any who prefer the communistic system or any other form of absolutism to our American system. Overseas 1947 showed Europe's desperation. Amid this misery, the world became aware that Soviet Russia had found a perfect breeding ground for red terrorism. As the communists capitalize on Europe's agony, President Truman throws down America's challenge. So long as communism threatens the very existence of democracy, the United States must remain strong enough to support those countries of Europe which are threatened with communist control and police state. America's youth lines up for the nation's second peacetime draft. 9,600,000 young men will register during the three weeks period, and all youth reaching 18 will be required to register. We know we live in a critical, highly explosive period. We are aware that we bear arms because of the need for military power to defend against communist aggression. America, wake up. The Cold War is real war. Nikolai Lenin laid down for his followers the plan for world conquest. First, we will take Eastern Europe, next, the masses of Asia. Then we shall encircle that last bastion of capitalism, the United States of America. Will the United States fall? Yes, this could happen leaving our people groping in the rubble of their homes and sifting garbage for sustenance. Liberty stems from the heart of every American. But for our servicemen, a threatening invader might strike fiercely and quickly at the very heart of liberty. Liberty, a mighty force heard round the world. So here's to our army, from the newest recruit to the mightiest of the top brass. Here's to them for their selfless devotion to our cause. And here's to them twice over on this Army Day. They always had a boogeyman, and the Russian, now it's the Russian. Before it was, you know, somebody else, but now it's the, definitely the Russians, you know, the communists. They're going to attack us. We're defenseless. We've got to get more submarines, more guns, and so forth. Now the people go into a lull. They start fearing communists in their backyard. Communists got to crop up in their soup. You know, communist infiltration of the school, because that's the program. Give them what they want. They want more battleships. Give them all the money they want. Unfortunately, the people get lulled into this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they believe it. And like they're going to believe it until the day they get wiped off the face of the earth. You had to prepare a nation to think a certain way, and the direction was a Cold War against Russia. So why is the Cold War against Russia? It has to be communists. So if it's communists, it's domestic too, since they become the spies, right? The domestic ones become spies. So you had to lay the groundwork. And you did that by smashing the, the progressive unions, smashing everyone, making everyone in a hysterical state of mind so that you can move people in a direction that you want them to go. I have a list of about 100,000 subversives in this country, which was compiled under my supervision and direction. I shall move to create a bipartisan committee to rid the federal payroll of communists, pinks, socialists, and others who do not believe in the American form of government or in our free enterprise system. New York's annual Loyalty Day Parade is reviewed by General of the Army, Douglas MacArthur. Up windswept Fifth Avenue, the marchers bear the proud flags as they affirm their allegiance to the United States. This is no field day for Moscow or its sympathizers. Hundreds of thousands who cheered the two-hour parade were in complete accord with the loyal spirit of the marchers. In 1950, men throughout the world learned to look on the brutal face of communism. Union Square in New York was the backdrop for these scenes of red violence. From their ranks will come the saboteurs, spies, and subversives, should World War III be forced upon America. The potential danger to our national security is great. In effect, there are 25,000 potential foreign agents in the United States. The FBI is doing a magnificent job at the present time 
in keeping your government constantly alerted and advised as to the plans of the remaining communist conspirators. Well, the FBI always had followed me, mm -hmm. always went into my office. Is that right? I mean, during the Mahoma McCarthy period? That's right. Would follow me from the time I'd leave this door, take the subway with me, go to the building. I'd say, all right, fellas, you want to go up on the floor that I'm working at? Say, no, we'll see you later. See, a guy would come across the street and accost you and say, uh, you're a hunter, aren't you, Mr. Hunter? Could I have a word with you? And you'd say, uh, you, you know, I knew right away who it was. So I'd say, no, you can't have a word with me because I'm in New York City and I had enough words with you in Chicago. Now, why the fuck don't you go in and leave me alone? Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Hunter. Don't get mad. Now, wait a minute. By this time, a guy comes from the steps, a big husky guy, see? He comes running down and says, what's going on here? Now, there they are, the two of them. What the hell's going on? They're, they're doing one thing to me. All the neighbors are listening, and half of them aren't going to speak to me for the next six months, right? Because they're, they're, there I am, a red and near the FBI, and they're the heroes, and, you know, a whole. I had to sit down and talk to my children that they might be um, accosted, that they know that their mother and father never did anything wrong. In fact, whatever we did was to help the community. Flashed a badge at me. He says, Mr. Seagram from the FBI, I wonder if you'd like to talk to us about the communist conspiracy. I just smiled and said, no, thanks. I suppose I could have gotten off some good retorts, like I don't know about any conspiracy or anything. Woody Guthrie got off the greatest line. He visited Woody, and he wrote a song about it. The FBI comes and knocks on his door. And Woody says, and I, being so foolish, I let him in. They asked, would I fight for my country? I answered, the FBI, yay. I will point a gun for my country, but I won't guarantee you which way. I won't guarantee you which way, I won't guarantee you which way. I will point a gun for my country, but I won't guarantee you which way. I said, what do you want? And he says, well, I want to talk to you about your trip to Russia. I said, and I am willing to talk to you about my trip to Russia, but first, there are some other things I'd like to talk to you about. Are you interested in why you white folks are bringing the dope into this community to our young people? You want to talk about that? I am perfectly willing to talk about that. You want to talk about the majority of the men in this community are beginning to lose their jobs, that there aren't any jobs for them? You want to talk about that? I'll talk about that. You want to talk about young blacks who don't have a job and who will never have a job because of this system. You want to talk about that? I'll talk about that. Otherwise, you dirty SOB, and I won't say, you know, you get off my porch and don't you ever come back here again. And I pushed him. And then he was scrambling, trying not to fall. And the other one was trying to hold him up. And then they started walking real fast down the street. I said, and it's very dangerous for white folks to be in this community after dark. So you better watch it when you come back here. They'll find you chopped up in the alley. And all the neighbors were out looking, you know, when they finally got out of sight. And the neighbor yelled, hey, Mrs. Woods, they might send two others back. But I bet you they won't send those back again. Hey, Bill Bailey. And I said, yeah. It was a stairway. And I sometimes have a, a odd for me to remember a face, uh, yeah. especially if you've got your boiler clothes off or something like that. If you, you know, in the engine room or something, you know, everybody sort of, you get to know everybody. But once he puts his nice suit of clothes on with a collar and tie, you lose track of him, see? And I said, yeah. He said, hey, man, I got something for you, you know? I said, you have? Yeah, what do you got? Come on upstairs. And I figured it must be some fireman I knew, or some guy. And he comes up, he's here. And I take it, and it says, <laughs> the House on American Committee demands your presence. You have the city hall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, there, you know. And that's what happened. It was a subpoena. And I said, OK. And the guy walked down. I said, thank you, son of a bitch. What is your name, please, sir? William J. Bailey. 
I think I could save the committee a lot of time if you would allow me to uh, read a statement off that I have uh, laboriously put down on paper. If you allow me to read it, I'll... Did you write it or did somebody else write it for you? I'm quite capable of writing my own statement, Mr. Oh, Congressman. Why do you make that type of inference? Do I look like an idiot or a dummy here? I wrote the statement. Were you at any time during 1946 acting as the West Coast coordinator of the Siemens branches of the Communist Party? Now, where would you get that information? Is it wrong? Well, where would you get the information? Is it wrong? Well, Mr. Chairman, I decline to answer that question or any other question dealing with organization names or anything else. All I want to do is just get up there and tell them, go and screw yourself as quickly as possible and get the hell out of the way, you know? And as far as I'm concerned, if they was to ask me ordinarily, are you a communist? I'd say, yeah, you son of a bitch, and I'm proud of it. But in this thing, you couldn't do it, you know? Well, well because the, that was the whole name of the game. I mean, are you a communist? If once you answered the fight question, then from then on, you had to answer and answer and answer, and you couldn't, you know, answer only the questions you wanted to answer, and that's right, you know? Are you a member of the Communist Party? Well, frankly, uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't think that's any of your business. I would Will give you, you the same the answer I have given the FBI, the Red Squad, the police department, and everybody else. That is just none of your business. Let the record show that the witness has raised his voice in contempt of the Committee of Congress. I came out of there and somebody said, I heard it on the radio. You shouldn't talk to a senator that way or a congressman. They felt, you... they felt that was wrong, shouting at them. What did you say? I said I should have picked a chair up. Uh, any decent American would have picked a chair up and threw it at the bastards. We are granting you the right to refuse to answer any question that you think might incriminate you. But don't you and think that not not myself on the Constitution obligates me to say a word or two about the origins of this? I am a student of American history and Mr. have been for many years. Uh, you're ordered to answer the questions only. We're not going to take a lecture from a man who refuses to state whether he's a member of the Communist Party as of this moment. We're not going to take a lecture from him on the Constitution of the United States. We don't think we need it. You will answer the question. Sir, this is not a simple question. This is a, a question that goes to the depths well, of my conscience as an American. Here's one that is simple, and if you want to argue about it, do you believe in the overthrow of the United States government by force or violence? I must refuse to answer that question, basing my refusal upon the privilege granted to me in the Fifth Amendment. And in line with your words, sir, I wish you would allow me to spell out that privilege and what it means. Uh, and why I am evoking it. No, I don't think all everyone Americans in this room know knows this. Mean. Very few people know this. Why don't you give me a chance to state this? Write a book. I, I shall. And I have. Well, write another. Most of the people they called up before them declined to cooperate. They used the Fifth Amendment which in effect says, you have no right to ask me this question. But I was in a much stronger position. I didn't have any job they could fire me from. I sang at schools and camps for people who didn't care much for this committee. I simply said, I think your whole line of questioning is something that no American should be forced to undergo, especially under threat of reprisal if they give the wrong answer. I said, I have a right to my opinion, you have a right to your opinion. And from then I, I clammed up. And after about an hour, they gave up on me. A lot of people may raise the question, why all this hullabaloo about being fair, particularly when the people you're investigating are a bunch of traitors? In fact, I've heard some people even say, after all, they're a bunch of rats. Why don't we go out and shoot them? Well, I agree that the communists are rats. But on the other hand, remember this. When you go out to shoot rats, you've got to shoot straight. <laughs>
patience of the American people has been tried almost to the breaking point. And within the next two weeks, uh, I shall introduce into the Congress of the United States legislation designed to outlaw the party and its agents in this country. Now, it just seemed to me that if we're going to have all sorts of bills directed towards this communist front organization and another one that is infiltrated or communist dominated, that sooner or later we should get at the main core of the issue, namely the communist party itself and the entire conspiratorial communist apparatus. It was with that thought in mind that I introduced my amendment, which was a substitute for the measure before the Senate. That amendment would outlaw the communist party and would subject all members of the communist party who knowingly or willfully or intentionally were members of the party, knowing its purposes, would subject them to criminal penalties. McCarran Act legislated the deportation of foreign-born American citizens alleged to be subversives. Subversive Activities Control Act demanded registration of communists and members of communist front organizations as agents of a foreign government. Introduced by Richard Nixon. Emergency Detention Act introduced by Hubert Humphrey set up detention camps for subversives to be used in case of national emergency. Seven such camps were prepared. Communist Control Act, intended to outlaw the Communist Party. They spent so much money and they spent so much time on chasing communists. I feel like there must have been something. I mean, for example, were you ever asked to, they always say, were you were asked to transmit secrets? Never. There's no, what, I don't know, who am I going to transmit them to? Well, to spies from the Soviet Union. I wouldn't tell a Noah spy if he popped up in a cup of tea. It's about time Paul proved himself by doing something for the party, huh? Have him deliver this to our man in Chicago. But do you think we can trust him to deliver something like this? Why not? He's hopped up enough to do anything. And who'd bother to trail him? Huh. What'll I tell him? Now you can tell him anything you want to. I'm sure you'll believe it. <laughs> Paul, I'm so glad I reached you. In all of the 45 years that I was a member of the party, in all of the 25 years that I was in the leadership of the Communist Party, I can't remember any one instance of even the slightest suggestion that such a thing would be suggested or asked of any member of the Communist Party. Well, one would have laughed. Well, I've been scornful of anyone who would have suggested such a thing. As a matter of fact, I, I, we, we would have looked upon such a person as an agent provocateur. But, the, but the, the thing is, the accusations are constant throughout years and years and years. But this. not the indictments. I mean, isn't it strange that all the communists who were indicted as communists in the country are not indicted on charges of espionage, but all the communists are indicted on the Smith Act on charges of conspiring to advocate something at an unnamed future time. Now, clearly, with all of the enormous army of the FBI focused on the, on the Communist Party as it was, if they could find evidence of communists who had actually done these acts of espionage, someone would have been arrested for that specific act. You wouldn't need a, a, a conspiracy charge on the charge of advocacy, not the charge of acting, mm -hmm. not the charge of doing, but a charge of teaching, of, of, of speaking, of carrying out what are really protected First Amendment rights of free speech. I have here the names and the pictures of the people who are selected to run the Communist Party at the last national convention of that party in this country. And since 1948, altogether, 105 of the principal leaders of the Communist Party in this country have been indicted, and of these, 67 have been convicted for conspiring to advocate the overthrow of our government by force and violence. However, there are some loopholes in our law that need to be plugged. We need a new law to eliminate communist control of any industrial organization or any labor union. Hand the old papers and they sorry and they hand you a big sheet. Have you ever been, or have you ever was, or will be, and all that jazz, or isn't it true, so forth, and all of the business, see? And they say, therefore, we cannot sail until you answer all these questions, 
And as a left winger, as it would have, as being principled, you can't answer these questions. You have to tell them go to hell. What right have you got? That leads into the next question. We have all the rights in the world, and we're gonna. If you, that means you must be a communist, and in, I will present charges against you, which they did. Well, to make a long story short, it was almost ten years. Ten years they kept us out of the industry. A, spe a list I'm talking about a of all, oh, of all the left wingers within the. Uh, Within the uh, maritime union, was it every, a lot of every oh, a lot of people wiped out the left. My dear friend, guys they sail with, guys they ship made, drink with, and so forth, and I used to tell him, I say. But how can you sit there? What's, what's going on? This guy said, guy said, look, Bill, what the hell am I going to do? I've got a sick mother. i got a wife. i got four kids. I'm stuck with all that. I'm stuck with a mortgage. I can't afford to lose the job. Now, you could. You know how to rough it. You've been through this stuff before. You know how the cops beat you up. You've been in jail. You rode boxcars. You know, all that stuff. You can take it, you know. I can't. Didn't you ever think, I'm going to get out of this communist party? No, no, no. What would be the purpose of it for? If I wanted to get out of the button, I wouldn't have joined it in the first place. You know, if chips are down, you know, and I was ready to, to do everything, you know, being devoted and being dedicated, and certainly in order to help and, and to help the workers all over, if I would quit when there's a first attack, what would happen if there really had fascism in this country? Right? No, you have to start to think in terms of where do you fall? By the mid-50s, the political landscape of America had dramatically changed. Fear gripped those who'd had even the slightest connection with the movement of the 30s. Progressive unions, civil rights organizations, cultural groups. Almost everything left of center was crippled by intense attack. But relatively few long-term communists left the party because of the McCarthy period. In 1956, three years after Stalin's death, Nikita Khrushchev delivered a speech on the Stalin era that sent shockwaves through the American left. Khrushchev painted a picture of socialism gone horribly awry. Stalin had been allowed to rule with an iron hand. He had murdered many thousands of respected communist leaders because of his fear of political opposition. Fully two-thirds of the leadership of the Russian party fell victim to Stalin's purges. I was staggered, and I just started drinking. Did you take any action? No. I didn't know what to do. I was bewildered. I had spent, uh, oh, 16, 17 years as a full-time functionary. I couldn't have any alternative perspective. I was just so staggeringly overwhelmed by reading and rereading the Khrushchev uh, report. And uh, as I read, I began to relate what was described in that report to my own experience here in the United States. And uh, the way I looked at it was well, what if the American Communist Party had had the same power in the United States? We had said these things were not true. We had never, none of us had ever had a moment's doubt in our mind in being able to reject all of these allegations as being 
the fabrications of those who hated the Soviet Union. And as I sat there listening, the, the tears are coming down. I'm crying so hard I can hardly stand it. And it goes on, the reading goes on for about two hours, two and a half hours, kind of a relentless adding of agony upon agony upon agony. I, I, I don't, I can't say I felt very angry. I, I don't remember. But I certainly had know that I never felt any uh, qualms about staying in the party. For me, I was turned off from the communist movement and the Communist Party in this country immediately. Others had a different reaction. They were moving, tried to move in the direction of changing the party into being a more what was your democratic. Reaction? I was turned off immediately. I dropped out of everything immediately. I would have no part of it. You can't throw St everything, Stalin out with the revolution and all. He did participate in building the revolution. Now, what happened subsequent years where he made a very serious mistake and did harm in many ways. If you're gonna use that as a basis for being in or out, then you're really losing sight of the main objective of the communist movement. The Stalin revelation split the party wide open. So great was the controversy that for the first time, the pages of the Daily Worker were thrown open to varying points of view. There had been other traumas over the years for communists to grapple with. But the Stalin revelations raised fundamental questions about the very nature of American communism. To the editor, we must take a hard look at ourselves. I say the problems don't begin and end in Russia. The problems are in our own backyard, our own party We're here. seeing that our party has felt the deadly influence of Stalinism from top to bottom. We can't contradict Does our Does the leaders. structure of our party really work? Is it effective, or does it just give power into the hands of a few? The leadership isn't infallible. We must create infallible. a party that fits American life. We must be open, not secretive, and we must be completely democratic. The American people We communists demand freedom of speech everywhere, but too often we have failed to demand it in our own ranks. I say our idea of democracy just isn't working. We've become rigid. We had a principle called democratic centralism. That is, uh, there has to be some centralized bureaucracy, but there is a whole hierarchy which is uh, put into existence and controlled and operates in a very democratic fashion. What actually happened, as I see it, was that there was lots of centralism and practically no democracy. You did have discussions. You, know, you had pre-convention discussion before a convention was going to be held. And uh, what it all meant, I'm just not all that sure because I think, and, look, and not only looking back, talking with a lot of people who were in the leadership, that it was pretty much made from the top. The bureaucracy fell awkwardly on some, less awkwardly on others, but fell on all of our shoulders. You made decisions about people's lives. You expelled people from the party. I was a little Stalin. I don't have to talk about other people. If you did raise a question, they would simply say, did you read the latest article on political <laughs> affairs? Hmm. You either lied and said you did and, and understood you, it, which you didn't, didn't. you know. But so they, the they kind of brought the weight of their position and the weight of their intellect and the weight of their experience behind what they said. And when I say they, I'm talking about that, that person who you were dealing with as your direct yeah. Superior. He in was quotes. probably a section person. Yeah. But there, there's something that seems to me sort of somewhat off kilter here because you're all trying. You talk about creating equality was very important in a democratic society, a better world. Yeah. But yet you but had a fundamentally undemocratic movement to yeah. create that, and that somehow, how can you? How well, is that ever going to come about? I, I think that there was that basic flaw in our situation. Well, of course, it, it was would a not. Flaw. I don't think that that would no, uh, of exist today. Flaw. I think we're all a little too wide-eyed a little yeah. too independent in our thinking. I can say this now for myself. I would not submit to that kind of discipline I again. I think it no, was I a wouldn't. glaring weakness. Yes, I, 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 you know, we've been fudging sure. saying that, but I don't know why, sure. because it's true. It I, I don't know anybody weakness. who wouldn't say that. But could you have accomplished as much on the other side? Very likely not. 
And I think that's, that's the key that's to it. it. That's, that's the, the key to it. Problem. Yeah. We all, we today, sort of instinctively knew that if we had the luxury of sitting around and talking about every decision that we were going to participate in, that we wouldn't get out on the picket line, and that's where we belonged. I really sincerely believe today that there is an extraordinary, that there is a great connection between ends and means. And I think we could at one point say, well, as long as our objectives are all that great, we can do all these crappy little things on the way. Um, and I think a lot of organizations still operate like that. Sure. And I think nations operate like that. Um, and I don't believe that at all anymore. I think there's a direct relationship between how we might have built a party that was democratic and, mm -hmm. the, and the kind of society that might have come yeah. out of that. You said for many years you and most people in the party didn't question certain things, didn't question what came out of the mouths of the leaders of the Soviet Union, perhaps even somewhat the American party, didn't question some aspect of demo democratic centralism and so forth. And then later we're to find out that that should have been, we should have been questioning all along, right? What strikes me is the people who joined the party, to me, were people who were real questioners. They questioned the entire capitalist system they were brought up under. They were people who were, you know, by nature very, you know, very much against the system, very much active minds, wanting yeah. to change things. So how could it that these same people could then have gone along and not question? I don't have, a, I really don't have an answer for that. I'm ashamed that I didn't. And I cannot figure out why anything that Stalin said had to be it's a, it's a sense, there's a certain amount of fanaticism here. Here I was, I thought I was such a clear thinker in examining my economic analysis of the nature of capitalism. Whatever. But if Stalin said it, or any of his close followers, it had to be gospel. It was absurd. I mean, life is not that simple. And truth is not that simple. And uh, uh, we didn't have all the truth. We had, you know, some few little bits and pieces of the truth here and there. Um, but the only way to build a movement is if you're speaking to genuine concerns of masses of human beings, and the only way to do that is to listen to those people. And uh, we didn't, our listening devices were, you know, poor and poorer. I hereby submit my resignation from membership in the Communist Party of the United States, effective immediately. I have come to this decision after 27 years in the Communist movement because I feel that the Communist Party has ceased to be an effective force for democracy, peace, and socialism in the United States. I think that the party had within it, you know, the seeds of its own destruction. And, uh, um, and I've thought a lot about this, obviously. If you take, if you, if something is that important in your life, you spend a lot of time thinking about it. And, uh, what you, you wonder is what happened to that dream, because here was this great bunch of people and they shared a dream and they cared, they cared about it enormously. Any unprejudiced observer would agree that we cared about the things that really matter. We want everybody to have a chance at a good life. And we were willing to give our whole lives for that idea and that dream. And, you know, and it went to pieces. You hate to see people leave that you love. Like the guy I mentioned to you yesterday, I just loved him. I just thought he was tops. I thought he was the smartest man ever. He left. I hated to see them go. Not only that, it diminished our numbers, which meant that we couldn't do the kind of work we had been doing before. I was saddened by it. It was sad that I would have to leave and find my own way, let's say, in my own little way to do the best I can. But you, know. you were alone. Well, there are others who left, you know, and, and uh, maybe because of our or something, we're not able to be as active as we were when we were younger. But I'm still interested in everything that goes on in the world. I'm still interested to help advance people wherever they are, you know. But when you left, it must have been hard to figure out what to do. Yes, it was. It was a vacuum in my life as to what do I go from here, what do I do from, you know, from now on. Move to a new place, 
began a new uh, career job-wise. Uh, actually became an apprentice in a new industry. In your, in, for in me. your 40s. In my 40s, I became an apprentice. It's been a long time getting myself together. It took me almost as long to get myself together as a person as I had spent in the party becoming a communist leader. It was uh, devastating. is 11 o'clock you are listening to kpfk in los angeles coming up next marxist commentary good morning this is dorothy healy with marxist commentary well i'm going to be doing a uh, in parts an unusual show this morning unusual for me that is in that while i am we've jumped forward 25 years in time that is filming. when the people in this film were young they decided to dedicate their lives to a movement for a radically different society in their middle years, that movement faltered. In various ways, they've gone on from there. But what remains of their dreams and ideals? On her radio show today, Dorothy's received a letter from a former communist. I'm a member of the broken-hearted generation, which also included my parents' generation. And there are thousands of us whose socialist aspirations turned out to be support for Russian nationalism, for bureaucracy, and for anti-Semitism, among other evils. Should I regret that so many productive years were spent supporting a cause that was not what I believed it to be and wanted it to be? Well, it seems to me that not only do we not have any regret, Nate, you and I and the other people of our generation, I know I have only an enormous amount of pride on what our generation did. We were part of the heart of humanity in our youth. We were reacting to and responding to and participating in the issues that helped to shape the history of our country. And as long as we did make, I think, that kind of dent, did we waste our lives, Nate? Well, I saw the Communist Party as the vehicle for getting rid of an insane, erratic, irrational political, social, economic system and uh, bringing into, into existence a rational, humane, uh, humanistic society. Socialism. I still believe it. You know, I'm no longer a communist. I'm not ashamed of having been one, but uh, I believe in a democratic humanist socialism. I hope to think that someday we will have socialism in America, but I think that it will have a big stamp on it that says made in the USA. Don't call me a former communist, call me a former party member, because I'm still a communist small c mm -hmm. in terms of wanting a cooperatively, communally controlled society where everybody has something to say about their life. You now, we're only on this planet a fleeting moment. As Sartre put it, uh, life is but a fleeting second, an absurd drop from the womb to the tomb. You should have something to say about that fall. Just as it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved before, it's better to have struggled and lost than never to have struggled. 
I think the saddest thing are the people who are scared to struggle. You know the famous poem, mourn not the dead, but rather mourn the apathetic throng, the cowed, the meek, that know the world's great anguish and its wrong, but dare not speak. So really, if you're going to mourn, don't mourn for a fighter who made a mistake and lost, but mourn the suckers who never bothered putting up a fight. Tie him down for one solid day to, to show him the impressive desire of the people to uh, stop investing in big munitions and nuclear plants, you know? That's the main thing. Basically, it's to make the people aware of the danger that's confronting us if we don't do something about it. Wall Street is the central figure of finances where they invest in all the nuclear plants and all the places where they shouldn't do. Are you willing to go to jail with the rest of your buddies? Oh, yeah, of course. Why not? I've been in jail before. It's nothing big. Uh, now the jail's a little better, you know. <laughs> they give you a coffee ad, where the other days give you nothing. I'm talking about the older days of you. You gotta have a better system somewhere along the line, right? None of these things ever come easy. You have to put up some kind of a beef. A scream, a holler, a scratch, or make some sound that you're alive, that you could fight, you know, a cough, or do something, you know. Otherwise, they just walk past you and look at you, and he must be dead, he ain't moving, right? If I know I can do something about something, I do it. And I don't put it off. If there is a demonstration, or if there is a, um, Something that has to be done in a political sense, I really don't need anyone to tell me to do it. I do it. And that, Try hard. <laughs> I'm sure that that comes from the many years in the movement. And I like that feeling because I feel a part of the mainstream of life. And that's a good place to be at 60 years old. I want to tell you that the senior citizens, who are 10% of the population in our country, are 30% of the poor in our country. More than half of the senior citizens in our country live on Social Security as their sole or main source of income. The elderly who worked all their lives and helped build the wealth of this country are not asking for luxury. What we are asking is to finish however many years we still have, to be adequately housed, adequately fed, and adequately clothed. This is what we consider a right and not a privilege. Do you know why I'm the little? I was put on this earth to make all the people who will come and say, oh, you're, there's somebody shorter than I am. And that makes them happy. And that's what my function in life is. <laughs> you know the, the term, she's 10 feet tall. I feel so sure of what I have to say. When I get up to speak, I feel like I'm a big, big person. Isn't that, <laughs> I don't know whether it's immodest or what. But I, that's the way. I never think of myself as being a little nothing. I think of myself as being a big something. <laughs> Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream that dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great strong land of love, 
Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. The millions on relief today, the millions who have nothing for our pay, for all the dreams we've dreamed, and all the songs we've sung, and all the hopes we've held, and all the flags we've hung. The millions who have nothing for our pay, except the dream we keep alive today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, and yet must be the land where every man is free. The land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. Oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be. God damn right. They can't stop it. And that was the kind of thing that caught hold of us. Because regardless of the ideology and everything, there, there, there was that with us. And we would die for each other because we believe this right down to the bottom of our soles of our feet. And we still believe it today. And we're here. We're here. And we're going right on. Right on. You know it's darkest before the dawn this thought keeps me moving on if we could heed these early warnings the time is now quite early morning if we could heed these early warnings the time is now, quite early morning. Some say that humankind won't long endure, but what makes them feel so doggone sure? I know that you who hear my singing could make those freedom bells go ringing I know that you who hear my singing could make those freedom bells go ringing and so we keep on while we live till we have no more to give and when these fingers can strum no longer and the old banjo to young ones stronger and when these fingers can strum no longer and the old banjo to young and stronger play that heart Before the dawn, this thought keeps us moving on through all this world of joy and sorrow. We still can have singing tomorrow. 